um, Joshua Jessup. Uh, he was taught the gospel of Jesus Christ from his youth by a very knowledgeable father, and so he's familiar with the functions of the church, priesthood, and kingdom of God. Um, he's in a, introduced um, to the way the Lord operates. Uh, often simple things have profound implications in the gospel. And he, has a, he is a studier of, of these things. He learns by both study and faith, and often pairs study and faith together in his learning. Astounding results. While he doesn't have much experience in sharing the things he has learned, he has a deep desire to share the wondrous simplicities of the gospel. His presentation is titled, The Ten Commandments. And if those online could please mute. I'm going to start with an overview. And so first off, the Ten Commandments is written in a covenant format. That means that the Lord introduces himself first. It's not necessarily covenant, but it's very important. <laughs> and then so when the Lord introduces himself in Exodus 20, that's not part of the Ten Commandments, but it's very important, right? <laughs> um, so I won't be going into it too much. And, okay, here's my statement. It's going to be very bold. Okay, whenever the Lord gives a commandment, in, give, gives commandments in tandem, he always, every time, gives the most exalting commandment first. And then the next commandment is to get to that one. And the previous commandment is to get to the next one, etc. <laughs> so... In this case, it's a series of Ten Commandments in tandem. The last one, the, the tenth one gets you to the ninth one. The ninth one gets you to the eighth one, etc. So, I'll be going in reverse. <laughs> um, so, so, starting with the tenth one. So I have it as it reads right now, right? Essentially, thou shalt not covet anything which is your neighbor's, right? <laughs> um, if it doesn't belong to you, don't desire it so much so you can take it away from somebody else. <laughs> kind of thing. But really, what it is, is gratitude. Be grateful for what you have. Be grateful specifically to the Lord for what you have. This is a principle that's very um, very understood in the Book of Mormon, right? Um, every, every prophet in the Book of Mormon always points to the last great miracle that, that the Lord gave to the children of Israel. Okay? The reckoning of time, even, was based on this concept, the last great miracle, and, and instilling gratitude in the hearts of the people, because gratitude is the foundation of righteousness. And without gratitude, righteousness cannot be achieved. And with gratitude, wickedness cannot be achieved. So <laughs> I'm going to be pretty quick, <laughs> just because I tend to get to the point, get to it quickly and move on, get to the next one. Um, but, but anyhow. So this one is honesty. You know, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor is all about being honest. Right? You might also say thou shalt not bear false witness against thyself, or thou shalt not bear false witness, period. Right? <laughs> but particularly, particularly when it's damaging to somebody else, right? But it's about honesty. Be honest. <laughs> and and if you notice, if you're grateful, right, being honest becomes a lot easier. It becomes a very small step rather than a big one. We're not used to being honest. We're also not used to being grateful. With grateful, honesty becomes easy. So the next one is very similar, right? Thou shalt not steal. You might think this is also about being honest. Well, it is. 
And it's a little bit more. It's about being honorable. It's a little bit of step up from honest, right? <laughs> um, so how do you be honorable, right? It, you'd be worthy of somebody's praise. That's, <laughs> that's interesting. That's a, something that's a very difficult thing to achieve sometimes. Also, something easy to achieve at other times, you know, based on how well they know you, etc. Um, <laughs> so, this one's going to be a little bit more in depth. Thou shalt not commit adultery is really be that chaste, right? But what is chastity? If the Lord chastens those he loves, right? This is not something I usually do, but I use its, its own itself to define it, right? Um, if the Lord is chastened, those what, what's chastening? It's being made chaste, right? So if we're chastened because we hurt, we hurt our neighbor, that means hurting our neighbor, right, is being unchaste. So, so what is chastity? It's, it's, uh, it, has, it is actually very simple. It has to do with relationships, right? And it's just keep relation, keep sacred relationships sacred. Everything, everything that should be in the re relationship must be. And everything that should not, must not be. It's really simple, yeah? <laughs> Same time, it's not always easy. So, this one I get to speak a little bit more on too. You got to talk about Nephi, etc. Um, <laughs> I shall not kill, right? What should we do about this, huh? What is it? It's not just preserving life, it is preserving the sanctity of life. Life is sacred inherently. But if a living creature is perverting something else that's sacred, it becomes not as sacred. <laughs> so let's talk about, uh, and, and it's an interesting thing, it's that Nephi, right? Nephi and Laban. Nephi's commanded to kill Laban. He says, well, what about this? <laughs> I've never wanted to kill anybody, right? I've always wanted to keep this commandment. And the Lord literally had to convince him that that's what exactly what he was doing by killing Laban is that he was keeping this commandment and that without killing Laban this commandment would be broken and this, and the <laughs> also talk about the wars in, in the you know defense the armies of the Nephites in defense They were willing to kill people to keep sacred things sacred, to keep their own lives sacred, and sanctified. So uh, first off, you know, which life particularly which should we keep sacred? <laughs> it's kind of important, right? Which life do we have the most power over? It's our own. Keep your own life sacred. So, yeah, these are getting pretty difficult, huh? <laughs> so here, it starts going, you know, before that, it was about your character, what you were doing. Now it's about your perception. And this one's already in the positive, so I don't have to, to translate this one at all. Um, so, honor thy father and thy mother. And it has a promise with it, that thy days may be long on the land which the Lord God gave give it, right? So how do we honor our father and mother? First off, we honor them in our minds, right? There are, you know, I, I cannot think of a single mortal being that I respect more than my father. And if there's one that comes close, it's my mother. 
So it's, it's that kind of a thing. That's the first place. Second place is, you know, like Nephi did, right? When he introduced himself, he says, I was taught by my father. Right? Isn't that exactly what he did? That's kind of what I did too, right? <laughs> um, he says, I was taught by my father. This is why I'm where I'm at. So your father and your mother, if they did no more than giving life to you, they did something for you that you could never, ever do for yourself. For that, they deserve your respect and your honor. This one also doesn't. <laughs> doesn't need it. It's also in the positive. Okay. At the same time, it's in the negative. Because we're not commanded not to do work on the Sabbath, etc. So remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So, oh, I have a question in the audience. Uh, I was going to ask you, Joshua. Sorry to change back one commandment, but what are your thoughts on how do you honor uh, parents when they aren't very honorable? Like, if you've got a great dad like Lehi, or your own dad that you admire a lot, that's, you know, that's not a terribly difficult commandment, but if you got a dad that's, you know, an alcoholic and beats your mom and <laughs> how do you keep, uh, what's your thoughts on how you keep that command? Okay, he says, how do you honor dishonorable parents, right? <laughs> dad who beats your mom, etc., kind of things. First thing you do, is live your life so that other people think that they were good. <laughs> right, so that, so that the passerby would think, oh, that guy must have really good parents. Okay. The other thing you do is, as I said before, right, they gave you life. They did something for you that you couldn't possibly do for yourself. They deserve your honor and your respect for that. If for nothing else. Farrell? We recently watched a, or, or Shabbat, we watched a Alpha Beta. Alpha Beta. Anyway, we enjoyed those quite a bit, by the way. And uh, it's really fascinating when you think about Abraham um, and his father running an idol shop. And so, in some ways, you might say, his father was not as honorable as we'd like to hope he was. But when you watch that whole presentation with Alpha Beta, he actually honored his father by continuing his father's name honorably, by, by connecting all of the sons of Terra honorably, meaning he married deceased brother's wife, raised families into them. All of those factors came together. And he honored his parent, who had got a little confused in some areas, by continuing that name and honor. And so Abraham is a prime example of honoring a parent who wasn't completely honorable. Okay, for those uh, on the... <laughs> Up over Zoom, I'm going to repeat what he said a little bit. I'm going to paraphrase it because I don't like repeating verbatim. <laughs> so Abraham was a prime example of honoring a dishonorable parent, right? And part of what he did is he made it so that his descendants could honor their ancestors honorably. And that is definitely a valid way to honor your father and mother. Yes? Um, just to add to what Pearl was talking about, um, also look at how Abraham, I love Abraham's example on so many levels, but look at how he turned to God as his true father. He respected his earthly father, but who was 
was his true father that he listened to and obeyed for a somewhat broad picture of love. Then that to me is amazing because you're right, that was incredibly <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, um, our father and our mother, we have more than one. We have a heavenly father and a heavenly mother too, and they need honoring first. Right? In fact, we can't very well honor our earthly father and mother without it. So, let's go on to the Sabbath. So essentially, you know, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You work for six days, you rest. And everybody in your household rests. Okay? So consider for a moment, right? And the Lord tells you why. <laughs> why he did it, right? So, does the Lord sanctify the Sabbath? Because he rested, or does he sanctify rest because of the Sabbath? Interesting. You know, the Lord sanctifies rest here, right? And interestingly enough, if you, if you ask anybody who's very successful at anything that they do, they intentionally rest. They're very intentional about their resting. That's, a, that's kind of important. It's a way to keep it sacred. But it's obvious here that the Lord sanctifies the Sabbath because he rested on that day. Because rest is sanctifiable. Rest is sacred. And uh, so, so uh, be intentional about how you're resting and what you're doing while you're resting, etc. I mean, for me, right, um, this meeting's been very restful. I feel very invigorated right now. <laughs> um, anyway, be intentional about how you're resting. Because rest is sacred. All right. So this one, I'm going to talk a little bit about how you break it and a little bit about how you keep it. So uh, this one says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And then he says it's very serious. Because if you take the name of your Lord God, the Lord your God in vain, he won't hold you guiltless. He will hold that against you. Very serious, huh? So what we should do about it, I think we need to hold the name of the Lord our God in reverence. But before we go there, um, ways to take the name of the Lord your God in vain, right? First, you can misuse it. Use it as an excuse to do terrible things, right? I don't think any of us have a particularly hard time with that one. Um, but it has been has been done throughout history. And the other thing is, right, if you've been baptized, you've taken upon yourself his name. If you depart from that covenant, you've done so in vain. If you're not obedient and don't treat him like a father, You've done so in vain. If you're not holding his name in reverence, you've taken his name in vain. So what does that mean exactly? Hold, hold, hold the name of the Lord your God in reverence. So when you revere somebody, you act a particular way towards them, right? First off, you try to emulate them. So anybody who's ever revered a famous basketball player or whatever tries to emulate what they do, right? Famous business person, 
every case. They try to emulate what they do. If they don't, if they're not trying to emulate what they do, they're not holding the name in reverence. <laughs> they're not holding them in reverence. So, so a lot of people th like to think of reverence as you know, be quiet and be still and don't interrupt, etc. That's not what reverence is at all. The name of the Lord your God should be the most important name you ever hear. <laughs> That's your goal. The end of your life to be like him. Yes? It makes me think of ordinances to come in the name of God. And so I think to administer ordinances differently from how God wanted you to or do ordinances in his name that he didn't want you to or change covenants. I mean, I think that could be another serious thing to remember. So, so uh, doing ordinances incorrectly is taking the name of the Lord, the Lord our God in vain too, right? Okay, also doing ordinances flippantly. To not really care about them very much. To not hold them in their proper respect. So, so the next one's fun. I shall not make unto thee and make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything. <laughs> Have earth above beneath, okay? Right? This is particularly true about God, interestingly enough. Don't make any graven images of the Lord your God. There's a graven image. Okay. It's kind of important. Okay. We have a question. Thinking about this one, I've always thought about this. When people say that, uh, when, when we're reading that, does that mean we can have pictures of Jesus on our wall? Like, reference to that one right there on the wall. Who might have had like, something like that on our house? Okay, so does this does this reply does this apply to pictures of somebody? Um, I think it is no less of a sin to have a picture of Christ than it is to have a picture of your family. Okay, to to uh, to have it done so that you can worship that picture, that's that's kind of a sin, you know. <laughs> um, and and it's. And it's a little dangerous in that if we have pictures of Christ, right, and that Christ actually shows up, we don't recognize him because it doesn't look like the picture. Hmm. <laughs> so we have another question. Right. Pictures are for remembrance rather than for for idolatry. Um. So, so if we're not to have any graven images, right? What do what are we to have? What are we to do? Here's what we need to do: know the Lord thy God, worship Him. Right? We have a graven image of the Lord our God in our minds, so much so that we we don't think we have any more to learn about Him. You think we have His character down pat? what it is in our minds. I think maybe if we do, we've engraved an image of him in our mind and, and his, his actual being will be different. So the other thing is, right? How do you know the Lord your God? How do you know me? First off, you have to meet me, right? <laughs> Talk to me. You hear my voice, etc. Until you've met God personally, you're not quite keeping it. At the same time, 
There's a reason it's stated in the negative and not in the positive in the first place. Yes? That is true. He knew that they had this tendency, right? And that is um, that is about the power of association, right? Everybody around them had this tendency and was doing this actively, and they were associating with that, and therefore they would have that same tendency. Um, Farrell. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, when I think of, uh, so I'm not making myself any ingrained. I think that means don't create God in mind. <laughs> right. So don't don't create God in our image. <laughs> the Lord thy God to worship him. So if we put God in our box instead of letting him put us in his or however you want to say that, I think that would be a direct contradiction there. Right. If we put God and make him look like us, right? <laughs> Rather than trying to make ourselves look like him. Or at least our image of Right. And it's not usually usually even like us. Sometimes it's, uh, I would say, a Christian image of him that is uh, everywhere and nowhere and that is not understandable. You know, that's a graven image of God. Do we have a graven image of God in our own, in our own minds and our own hearts? I think it's the weakness of all religion to try to do that. Right. It's the weakness of all religion to try to do this just the same thing, right? And the Lord commands us not to do it, but to learn to know him. And interestingly enough, right, in order to see something, you have to have experience with it. And the Lord says, uh, when I come, my, my saints shall, shall know who I am because they shall be like me. And he also says the same thing in reverse. Interestingly enough, they shall be like me because they shall know who I am. So, so let's, let's continue a little bit, right? This one's very simple in the first part. Okay? I shall have no other gods before me, right? Initially, I had this to say that thou shalt put God first in everything that you do, right? But it's a, a little bit more than that. When Christ says that the, the most important commandment of the gospel is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and might and mind and strength, right? He's quoting this one. <laughs> so, yeah. You can't, can't love a being you don't know either. Yeah. Yes? Uh, in our day and age, Celebrity worship is really um, this is uh, as well as the last three. <laughs> sure. Yeah, it's in our day and age, celebrity and, and sports worship um, are our big things. Um, so, um, and, and it does speak to it. And, and if you notice, right, you know, if you're keeping the third one, keeping the second one becomes pretty easy, right? You hold his name in such reverence that you want to know everything you know there is to know about him. And you want to know it, and you want to know it from him. And that's just the way it is. <laughs> you don't want to know of him, you want to know him, right? And once you know him, loving him comes naturally.
So there it is. There's some interesting comments I could make about the series and tandem things because this is the first series, a series of series. <laughs> but, uh, and it's interesting which one follows exactly next, but let's not go into that just yet. And this concludes my presentation. Questions? <laughs> Uh, question is, why does the fifth commandment have an explicit blessing? <laughs> so I'm going to kind of go back to it a little bit. Part of that is that in order to do it properly, you need the blessing. <laughs> if you don't have the blessing, you can't properly do it. On the other hand, right, if you're not doing it, then having the blessing means nothing. Um, yes? So if somebody mentioned, um, like, part of honoring the father and mother is ensuring that their name lives on who your son and kid are. And so it's kind of part of it, I guess. It's like, it's pointless to honor, try to honor the father and mother in that way of preserving their name if you're going to be destroyed and what those things are. <laughs> so, and so it's kind of part of that, I guess, but on your father and mother, and if you do that, then I'll help you find that I say you can stay on this land that I see you can live on. Well, right. No, so, so that was Zoe. What she said is, is, that, is about preserving their name. And it's, and it's uh, oh, well, that is what I mean, yeah. When you honor your father and your mother, That's the take off. your children, oh. they honor you. And instead of having no support, you have support that will be there for you to carry you into your old age. I, I, my grandmother was brought into our home, and my great grandfather, and they died with our home. They were taking care of us younger ones, but we watched our parents take care of them. And then later, I got to do that for my parents. And that's when there's illness and different things, and a family comes together, they sustain each other. Okay. So what he was saying is, a, is, is kind of a, something that happens naturally a little bit when you honor your father and your mother, and you go through hard times, right? <laughs> They're there for you too. <laughs> and your siblings are there for you, etc. cetera. Um, much more so than if you don't. And, and, and thereby extending the life you have to live with them. Okay, I have two more questions and they're both about Uh, this one, <laughs> both about the Sabbath, right? And I'm kind of going to answer them together a little bit, right? Because one of them says, you know, because it mentioned specifically, right? Six days thou shalt, shalt thou labor, do all thy work. Right? So, yeah, work's really important too. <laughs> God's work. Absolutely magnificent. He wouldn't be God without it. Right? That being said, he wouldn't be able to do his work if he didn't do, if he didn't do his rest. So that's part of why resting is sacred. Um, is that it allows you to do your work. And to do if you don't rest, your ability to do your work suffers. Um, yes, we have a comment.
Okay. Um, he's asking about the things that happen on the days of the creation and if there's any relationship they have with what happens in the thousand years of the world. Um, okay. <laughs> I'm not going to go too much, too much into this. Um, but there is a specific purpose for each day. And a specific aspect that is being exercised. Yes? Rhonda? I was just going to say it absolutely has corollaries and parallels. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've taught whole classes on that. And, and I just want to say yes. They so, do. give us an example. Well, for instance, um, the, the first commandment that, that separate light from darkness, and you have the problem with Adam and Eve and, and the separation between evil and good. And then, you, you know, the first day when you, when you do the land and the water. Well, then you know that they, they, they parallel some of the um, the the uh, fourth day, the sun and the moon and the stars. You know, and you have um, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and you know they just they just parallel in a new way. Yeah, the fourth day, which we're given given sign things by with things with things to look toward, right to know. How to act, etc. The four thousand years we're given Christ, a thing to look forward, look to, to know how to act, etc. Um, <laughs> so yes, there is there is correlation, but let's not go too deeply into that. Yes. About turning to the Lord too, right? <laughs> yeah, it is. Six days we do our labors, make sure that everybody's fed, that everybody's taken care of, etc., clothed, fed. And on the seventh day we fast from doing so. And we turn our attention to God. That is part of rest. So this question says, uh, the comment, this comment, it says, my parents hate the way I live, very upsetting to them. And he says, they, I honor them by not engaging with them anymore and not talking about it kind of thing, um, not getting them upset, pointless conversation, et cetera. Because um, then they don't have to experience the emotions, et cetera. Oh, I kind of want to turn this back to this one, because in my mind, one of the worst ways to break this out 
is to be angry upon the Sabbath. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and to be, or to be offended upon the Sabbath. So anyway, <laughs> that being said, um, is that they can live in ignorant bliss. And <laughs> they don't have to be challenged by the way I live, etc. Um, that might be the case. But in Abraham's case, he did associate with his father for a time. As long as his father was willing to associate with him. And his father hated the way he lived. <laughs> Absolutely hated it. He was challenged by it at every moment. And eventually he did live. But part of it is that Sometimes they need to see the example of what righteousness is. And they need to be honored by you considering them to be intelligent enough to see an example. I pray that. To maybe see an example and turn to God for it rather than seeing an example and you know and that goes so far and then it has to end but <laughs> but I but that is something right and I actually don't know who this person is but believe it or not your parents <laughs> they're still challenged by the way you live every day it's not right in front of their face but they're still challenged by it Okay, any more comments or questions? Brother Joshua, what are your thoughts on the, the, the my days may be long in the lane, is that just merely if you're good to your parents, they won't kill you in your adolescence, or? <laughs> <laughs> so what are my thoughts on the, on, on the, the promise of this particular <laughs> thing, the days may be long upon the land? Um, First off, if we honor our father and mother in heaven first, right, we have his protection. And if we're not honoring him first, we're not honoring our earthly father and mother properly. Okay, so is it just that they won't kill us in our adolescence? Well, if we're honoring them <laughs> properly, right, you know, my, my mother and father never had that temptation, um, <laughs> as far as I was concerned. <laughs> um, I was not perfect, right? But I was respect, respectful in my imperfections. <laughs> yes? I've heard it said that uh, uh, Isaac, when he was offered as a sacrifice, he he was not a youth. He was not a teenager. And we know that because if he had been a teenager, he would not have been sacrificed. <laughs> 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 so, so Joshua Erickson says that the Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac wouldn't have been a sacrifice if it was a teenager. It would have been easy. Um, <laughs> it, is, it is noteworthy, though, that at those times, the adolescence... Adolescence uh, was not a word that they that was ever ever used. <laughs> um, there was no such thing as adolescence. <laughs> it was you were a child or you were an adult. Period. Yes. So this this uh, this blessing has to do with your name. Your name may be long upon the land through your descendants, etc. 
um, and your achievements. There's one other aspect, owning the land. In my family, owning the land and being able to pass it on to your generation. And then they pass it on to their generation. You will belong on the land. And we have on the Harlem side of the family, land that has been in the family by generation. So, okay. We don't get rid of it. So, okay. So he's talking about land ownership, right? So that's something that the, the, the Jews in particular <laughs> um, did very well, right? Land ownership was generational. And lands could not be sold. Okay, if your land was sold, it was because your line ended. <laughs> or the Lord took you off the land. Or that the Lord took you off the land, right? Um, <laughs> and uh, it could be said that it was if it was because the Lord took you off, off the land, this is probably why. Because he gives a promise here. Right? Sometimes, sometimes it's not necessarily your fault. It could be your father's fault, etc. Um, that they didn't follow honor this commitment. But something to consider. Think about Israel. We are going to receive it when we turn our hearts to the Father and honor them. But when we don't, the land is given to the strangers. So that this it, it's. It's a blessing with our, it's, it's information within information if you consider not just your familial relationship, but the land and the blessing God gives us because it's our land, but he won't let us live on it if we don't honor him. Yeah, um, so on, honoring, honoring your parents is also a requirement to keep the land. Joseph. One of the thoughts that I have if we take scriptures like this and read it backwards is that if we are not honoring our parents, then our days won't be long. <laughs> and one of the reasons for that may possibly be that when we're in the act of obeying our parents and honoring them, God sends angels to protect us for that obedience to that law. And when we disobey our parents and dishonoring, he cannot send protective angels, angels in our behalf. And so we're at risk of losing our life and everything when we are not honoring our parents very seriously in danger. We're outside of the protection of God, outside of protect, protective angels. Yes, that is correct. Um, when we are not honoring our our father and our mother, our God, our heavenly father and mother, right? Then our days are short upon the land which God gave us. Um, and it's no longer our land. It's no longer our inheritance. And this could also go back to uh, you know Brother Nathan, Brother Nathan Bill's presentation, right? In the, in the land of promise, right? The land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, that is your land of promise. How long will you be upon it? It's based on this. How well you honor your father and your mother, and your heavenly father and your heavenly mother. Yes? I just have a thought, you know, kind of walk through the halls of this building, you can see the theme of this school, you know, that this school is very much uh, honoring our founding fathers. And here, so much dishonor on our founding fathers and think that this is based on you and your decisions and then make our day short on the land. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So so for the benefit of those over Zoom, this comment was was about honoring our our nation's fathers and etc. And that, that would be that is also a breaking of this commandment, right? To dishonor them. And it is a keeping of this commandment to honor them. And our nation is in peril because we're not properly honoring our founding fathers. Yes? The feedback on that, that applies uh, religiously too. Mm -hmm. The Book of Mormon says, uh, you know, honor your father Abraham 
and your mother, Sarah. Right? Um, and so that like religiously, there's honor of our religious ancestors as well. So, so he says, yeah, it's so honor of our religious ancestors as well. Or, and, or shall we also put it this way, that there's, there's honoring of your ancestors, not just your father and your mother, but their father and mother and their father and mother, etc. This is part of this law as well. Yes? There's a text in the Doctrine and Covenants. This is kind of the argument between Satan and the Father. He says, give me thine honor, which is thy power. And, and so if we're giving honor um, to our fathers and our mothers, we're giving them the power to lead us. And many, in many, there's the expansion of what that power can be. Okay. So, so this one is a of honor being power, right? <laughs> and if we're giving honor to our father and mother, we're giving them power. That is true. However, and this also goes this way, right? When we are giving honor to our father and mother and our heavenly father and mother, right? We are not only giving them power, but we are exercising power ourselves in the process. Isn't that interesting, huh? <laughs> yes? Yes, um, comment there so this doesn't go one directional, it's not one directional, it doesn't just go up, it goes down two into our posterity. So if we honor our father and our mother, our posterity will honor their father and mother. It's replicatable. <laughs> so is there any more questions or comments? Okay, I just ended the slideshow. <laughs>